Good morning, Redemption. Happy Sunday. Um, I think this is now our sixth week of the grand live streaming experiment, and it's beginning to feel like normal, right? I I hate that it's beginning to feel normal for so many reasons. Um, First and foremost, because I just, I miss you guys. I miss our time before and after service. I miss physically being in your presence. Um, But one of the other things that I hate about this starting to feel normal is our own habits that are calcifying as we sit on our couches and become more passive observers of worship services than we might otherwise be. Now, I hope that's not the case for you, but in case it is, um, let me urge you to fight against the calcification of the new normalcy of you passively observing services like this. Um, Here's what I really want to invite you to do, is bring your whole self to the Lord this morning. 
right? Bring all of your attention, bring all of your heart, all of your questions, all of your hurts, all of your hopes, all of your prayers. Really participate in full with us here this morning. Watch this unlike you watch any other Netflix show, right? We're not narcos. I don't look anything like Felix, um, but, but uh, more significantly than our production value, um, there is a radical difference in the presence of God that is available to us in the next 45 minutes as we try to draw near to his presence. So bring yourself, bring your soul as we pray, pray along with us. Don't just listen to my prayer, but pray with me. As Mike sings, sing with us. That's the whole reason that he's singing. That's the whole reason that we put the words on the screen for you. Um, Even as I preach, even as I share the message of the gospel with you this morning, I hope that you will engage and interact and ask questions. Right, you can ask questions to us directly through your social media platform, or you can ask questions internally of God. God, is that true? God, what does that mean? God, would you open my spiritual eyes that I might know you? If you're there to be known, let's come to him. So that's my biggest request to you this morning is engage with your whole self, with our good God. He is still available. He is still kind. He is still near. He is still with us even on strange Sunday mornings like this. Request number two is if you are at all new to redemption, if you're new to the city or new to our church or um, new to Jesus or whatever the case may be, would you reach out to us? Send us a direct message through Facebook, Instagram, whatever, um, or go to our website, redemptionhou.com slash connect, and just tell us you're here. We'd love to have virtual coffee with you. Our pastors are doing our best to incorporate, to help you figure out how to live life as part of this community. You can even join a small group. We're still meeting virtually, like really connect with us. You don't have to go through all of this alone. Let us love you. Reach out. With all of that said, Here's Mike.
bend down and hear a sky. Bend down, bend down, bend down and hear a sky. As we cry out to God now, as you bring your body into this, as we need you, God, we need to know how close you are. As would you just raise your hands with me? Would you actually stretch your arms out toward him, knowing that he is above the heavens, but he is bending down to us. He cares for you so much that he wants to hear from you and to speak to you and to meet every need that you have. If we could know and feel again how close he is today, that he would give us life. So with outstretched arms, let's tell him how much we need him today. Just speak to us, God. Let us hear you. up our eyes. now that you are this mindful of us, that you actually do care so much that you would bend down and listen, God, that you would remind us and soften our hearts today to help us remember and experience your presence, that you would give us new life again today. Lord, help us feel your warmth your care and your unbreakable love for us in a real way this morning. As we cry out to you, would you answer us?
given me space to breathe So I'll stay still until it sinks in
is good He's a love like no other your nearness comfort us now that in every circumstance that we go through uh, that you are constantly always with us just let us know your embrace this morning your love it is so much better than all the others help us to breathe in now and know your comfort and know that you're with us Give us some pause, some respite. God, just some rest from everything else storming around. Reassure us that you're here, God. Oh, is not lost. Is not lost.
presence in this life-giving, healing way. Would you comfort our hearts, Lord, every single one of us to know from you and, and through each other that we're not alone. God, would you stir us, Holy Spirit, to, to have this longing and, and the boldness just to, to raise our hands to you as we go through these days and tell you that our souls thirst for you. Assure us that we can trust you to take care of us, that you would satisfy us, that you've never left or gone anywhere. You were with us no matter what. Let us know you more. Would you draw us closer to yourself as we draw nearer to you, God? We need you today. In Jesus' name we pray. like me, but I can hardly believe that Good Friday and Easter were merely a week ago. Um, I haven't had a bad week per se, but I think something about this quarantine situation makes my weeks both feel very, very short and very, very long. And as much as I love Easter, you guys saw how crazy excited I was last week, um, I really do love Easter. I find myself this morning uh, still desperately needing Easter, S wishing that Easter weren't over, wishing that somehow what we could do for the next six weeks is celebrate that same message of Easter over and over and over. Well, the great thing about being in charge of the preaching here at Redemption is the things that I wish I actually get to do. So, so here's what we're going to do is for the next six weeks, we're going to join um, much of the worldwide church um, that pays closer attention to the church calendar than we typically do in celebrating Easter, not just as a single Sunday, but celebrating as a, a, it as a series of 50 days in a row. See, traditionally, um, Easter is preceded by a 40-day period known as Lent, and then it's uh, followed by a 50-day period known as Eastertide, right? So Easter isn't just a day. Easter is an entire season. And this is because 
I need the message of Easter and you need the message of Easter and we need the message of Easter over and over and over and over and over. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk for the next seven weeks about what it means for us to be resurrection people. Um, This week and next week, we're kicking off this series uh, very simply. This week, we're going to look at the cross. Next week, we are going to look at the resurrection. And what I want us to hear is this explosive good news of God. Right? See, the events that happened on Easter aren't just nice fairy tales. They're not just nice stories with a good moral at the end. They're not even just nice pieces of history. Right? They're, they're all of these, and yet they are somehow so much immeasurably, unfathomably more. You see, somehow this message of Easter, this, these, these words about what happened on Easter, this, this gospel of Easter is in fact the very thing that God uses to bring us life and freedom and explosion. You see, it's this preached message of the gospel that as we encounter, we do not hear merely as words, but somehow God promises and proves to us over and over and over again that he actually does, that as we preach these words, God himself shows up in our inner beings. So here's here's what I'm hoping happens through your TV screen or Android device or whatever you're watching me on this morning. I'm hoping that my words do not sit and settle merely as words. I'm hoping that my words, as we read the scriptures together, um, do for you and honestly for me something much, much more profound. I'm hoping that these preached words of the gospel will actually somehow be used by God for him to reveal himself in our very inner beings. You see, I'm convinced that in this time of the coronavirus pandemic that we are all living through, as we um, wrestle with furloughs and layoffs and sickness and worries and financial stress and whatever else comes along with this, um, and then all of our coping mechanisms and all of our stress and all of our bickering with our spouses or our loved ones or our isolation or whatever the case may be for your experience. I'm convinced that all of us need this message of the gospel. We, we need good coping mechanisms. We need good self-help advice. We need all of those things. I'm fine with all of those things, but much more profound than any of those things is the message of the gospel, the message of the cross, the word of the cross that is somehow God's power to make us alive, to bring us freedom and life and joy, to bring us love and hope and grace, even here and now, even in this moment in, I started to say 2019, but it's already 2020. It's still 2020. Okay, so all of that said, let me, let me read to you um, the first of a couple of verses that we're going to read. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the gospel of the cross of Jesus by considering five verses from Paul's letter to the Galatians. What we're going to do is we're going to look at three verses early in the letter. We're going to look at two verses late in the letter. And I promise you that these verses are going to be explosive. At least they are within me. I hope they are within you as well. Here's what Paul says. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, as you'll see on your screen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, do you see right there on your screen in verse 4, that first clause, that first phrase? Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age age. Okay, so Jesus giving himself for our sins. This is talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, and what has happened is Jesus has snatched us out of the grasp of a present evil age on behalf of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so here's the first part of the explosion. I'm just going to assert it now. Um, It will become more clear as we read more and talk more throughout the rest of this message, but here's the explosion. 
what Paul is talking about here in the, in, the, in the good news of the crucifixion of Jesus is that God isn't merely forgiving us as if he's just trying to be a good sport, as if he's just trying to overlook our misdeeds, forgiving our little peccadillos, letting us get by with a couple of sins. No, no, that's, that's not what the message of the cross is. The message of the cross is that God is on a rescue mission, uh, on a rescue mission snatching us from the grasp of all that has mastered us, of all that enslaves us, of all that keeps us in bondage, of all that is this present evil age. And in doing so, in giving himself for us, in crucify, in being crucified, in enacting this rescue, miss- this rescue mission, snatching us from the grasp of the present evil age, Jesus is somehow recreating the entire cosmos in the process, right? Does, does that make sense? Let, let, me, let me repeat that exact same thing to you again because this is... this. This is fantastically good news. I I told you I think it's explosive. And I don't think it's explosive merely because it's intellectually stimulating, although I think many of you will find it intellectually stimulating. I think it's explosive and fantastic good news because it will reorient the way that we think about ourselves and God and the entire cosmos. This is the point that Paul is going to make, so let me just state it one more time. Um, the, The gospel of the cross isn't merely that God is being a good sport and overlooking our peccadillo. No, God is on a rescue mission, snatching us from the grasp of all that has enslaved us and recreating the entire cosmos in the process. This is the gospel Paul declared. This is the gospel that constitutes us as Christians. This is the gospel that we celebrate at Easter, and this is the gospel that we celebrate week in and week out over and over and over and over and over Because it's this news, this victory announcement from God as he claims to be rescuing us from all that has enslaved us. It's it's this news that somehow God works within us and changes our very beings even as it starts to change our perception of ourselves and God and the entire world around us. You see, there are not just three actors on stage as we think about what God is doing in the cross. It's not merely that there is humanity and there is the sin of humanity and there is God as if God is trying to figure out how to overlook our sin. Of course, that's true. Of course, that's part of what happening, uh, uh, part of what is happening in the cross of Jesus. And yet, to view this work of the cross as if it only had these three actors on stage is to miss this grand fourth actor that plays such a central role in the early church's understanding of what Jesus had done. And that fourth actor is this present evil age. It's this present cosmos. It's everything that we live and breathe and do. It's the entire world and universe around us. It's the powers that have somehow dominated us. It's not just that God needs to overlook our sins. It's that God needs to free us from our sins. Okay, so I've asserted several things um, from those first three verses, but let's go ahead and look at the last two verses that we're going to look at together, and then we'll start to try to come to some sort of quick understanding together. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Okay, so what we've done here is we've skipped basically the whole letter. I've read you the introduction, the first couple of verses, and I'm reading you from among the very last verses. And yet, even in these five verses, I think we can, see, we can begin to see the explosiveness that completely reorients the, um, the world of the early church and I think can completely reor- reorient your world and mine, your soul, and mine, your spirit, and mine, your heart, and mine, your family, and mine, your work life, and mine. Here's what Paul says, Galatians 6, verse 14. Far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So 
remember those first couple of verses as Paul said what the work of Jesus in the cross was is it's this snatching out of the grasp of the present evil age. And in the conclusion, Paul says that he boasts in this rescue mission of Christ, in this cross, he boasts in it because somehow the entire cosmos, the entire universe, the entire world has been crucified to Paul because of the crucifixion of Jesus. And somehow at the same time, Paul has been crucified to the world. You see, there is this threefold crucifixion, which is what I want to walk through here in just a minute. But let, let me, let me um, let's, let's make this really practical, right? So here's the thing, is I think there is fantastic theology here from Paul, and I think there's fantastic theology that many of us, who, even who have been in and around the church, sometimes for decades, have not quite come to terms with. We have not quite let it settle in our hearts and souls and remake our world in apparently the same way that it remade Paul's world. And yet, um, we don't just want it to remain intellectual, or hypothetical, or theological. What we really want this to do, what Paul claims the gospel does, is that it gives us brand new life, that it sparks some sort of vast illumination within us where we say, I am not the same person that I was. The, the preaching of the gospel, as we come to believe it, as it starts to have its effect within us, as God works his word somehow deep within us here and now, Th this is a very practical thing, and so I just want to start by asking a couple of practical questions. Paul has asserted that we need to be saved. We need to be snatched out of the grasp of these powers that enslave us. So here's my question for you. Here's my question for me. What are you a slave of? What controls you? what dominates you. Until we know that, we cannot understand or adequately appropriate the work that Paul claims that Jesus is doing in the cross. If Jesus is liberating from this iron grasp of this present evil age, he's snatching us from this grasp. If we don't understand the things that dominate us, if we don't understand this fourth character, this fourth actor on stage that is this grand ruler of the current cosmos, or as Jesus repeatedly calls it in the Gospel of John, the ruler of this present age. If we don't understand how that plays out in our hearts, in our lives, in our consciousness, in our consciences, in our marriages, if, if we don't understand practically how this plays out, I don't, under, I, don't, I don't think we have much chance of understanding what the import of the Gospel is. So here's, here's the thing. Paul repeatedly tells us and asserts and assumes that you and I are enslaved. Now, um, living as a 21st century American, as a white male of significant privilege, um, there is no one that I would say tells me what to do. I am not enslaved in any social sense to any person. Never have been. I don't ever expect to be. I am very, very far removed from being a slave. And yet, am I not a slave? Does the good news of the gospel not apply to me? So let me ask myself and you one more time, am I enslaved to anything at all? Now, the first thing that begins to come to mind for me is, is addictions. It's these habits. It's these things that we do compulsively these compulsions that particularly come out in the middle of our great stress in the middle of times like this. I obey these compulsions even when I don't want to obey these compulsions. They may not technically, psychologically, according to the DSM, officially be addictions, and yet I find myself doing them whether I want to do them or not, whether I have shame about doing them or not, whether somebody has asked me to do them or not. I have these compulsions, and in a sense, I am very much a slave to those things. And so yes, part of what I want us to have in mind and part of what I do have in mind are these kinds of compulsions and addictions. But I wonder if what Paul is saying is even broader and deeper and more fundamental than that. I wonder if it's not the case that my entire life script is a form of slavery. My entire life script that tells me this is how to flourish, this is how to thrive, 
this is what to do, this is when to do, this is when to do it, this is what will happen if you do do it, and if you keep doing these sorts of things, then you might maintain some sort of sense of control over your life. I don't know about you guys, but I wonder if, particularly in this time, we might be a little bit more sensitive to the fact that in a very real sense, we lack control over our own destinies for all of the flourishing that we attempt, for all of the control that we pretend to have, for all of the facade that we put on, in moments like these, we realize how little control we have over our own lives. We realize that despite everything we do, the world around us is cold and cruel and seems entirely indifferent to us. Like, despite everything that we do, we are somehow marching to the beat of this drum that might not even pay off in the way that we expect it to pay off. Like, all these paths that we are trying to walk towards goodness, towards beauty, towards wholeness, and yet we still find ourselves surrounded by bleakness and sadness. Right, despite all that we do or don't accomplish in this life, for some of us it goes well, for some of us it doesn't go well, but even at the end of the day, regardless of what we've accomplished in this life, it is all still so temporary. It can all be stripped away so painfully, so ruthlessly, so instantly. And then one day, as our accomplishments vanish, as our families vanish, as our goods vanish, as our control vanishes, and then we vanish after rotting, and then we rot more after vanishing, what then? Are we not controlled somewhere deep in our humanity by the corruption of the world, by the cruel, chaotic, unpredictability of this world around us that we so desperately try to control. You see, as we ask these kinds of heart questions, practical questions, real questions, I think we begin to understand what Paul means when he says that you and I are enslaved And I think once we start to understand that we're not really in control of anything, even when we are succeeding, and especially when we're not succeeding, that we have no control, I think then we start to realize our desperate need for being snatched out of the grasp of this present evil age. So let's look again here at these couple of verses because Paul posits this triple crucifixion, and I want us to walk through um, very quickly. Because he's, he's boasting in this cross, and what I want to happen very practically for you this week and for me this week is for us to become people of resurrection who boast in the cross, who live our lives saying, I am a person of the cross. It has reoriented my world and my life and my soul. Praise Jesus for the cross. We revel in it and we hold it up as the decisive act of God in history as he rescues and liberates us. So Galatians 6.14 said, Far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You see, Paul is, has in mind that what happens to Jesus somehow isn't just constrained to Jesus, but also applies to Paul and then to the entire world around him. Um, Throughout the rest of the letter, he starts to develop this theme, and I don't have time to go into the rest of the letter for you um, this morning. Um, But let me walk you through a couple of things. Um, He he says in chapter 3, verse 10, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, and then he quotes Deuteronomy 27, he says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. A couple verses later, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. 
You see, Paul is boasting about this cross that snatches us from the grasp of the present evil age, not just in its apparent badness, but also in its apparent goodness. All of our virtues are being stripped away by the work of the cross and the gospel that comes to us through it. Here, here's, here's what I'm saying, is that Paul has in mind that somehow the entire world that we've built our foundation on, whether it's good or bad, whether it's we're insiders or we're outsiders, he has in mind that all of this is somehow stripped and crucified and put to shame and made powerless in the cross of Jesus. Jesus is crucified And therefore, Paul is crucified to the world, and Paul's whole world is crucified to him also. So here's what I want to do, is is I'm pointing out these couple of verses about the law, because what I want you to see is that even the good things in this world, even the good things in this cosmos, like the Old Testament, like the law of God, even this somehow ends up perverted and enslaving us. Right, so when I ask, what are you enslaved to? What is giving you your life script? What is telling you that if you do this, you will flourish and you will succeed and you will have and maintain and keep control over the things around you? In, in, in the world of Paul, that thing was the law. And what he says is even the good law, the, the people who rely on works of, of the law are under a curse because cursed is everyone who doesn't abide by all the things that are written in the book of the law. And more than that, more than just all of humanity being cursed by this good way of life, enslaved by this good way of life that is the law, more than that, God's own Messiah was cursed by the law because cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So here's, here's the shocking, surprising, perhaps confusing thing. The law, the way to keep in God's good graces, the way to maintain the blessing that God has promised to his people. That law that appears as if it's a good thing itself needed to be undermined and undone because that apparently good thing had become a slave master, a slave master, a task master, a cosmic force that held all of humanity in its grasp. Jesus is saving us even from the good things of our world like the law itself. Because not only did that law somehow exert its control and force over you and me and all of humanity, cursing those who didn't obey it, inviting some of us to obey it, and then cursing us when we couldn't completely obey it, it even cursed God's own Messiah because cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Okay, so here's, here's the thing. Paul is saying something very deep and theological here, that, that we need to be freed even from the good things of this world. We need to be freed from not just being poor, but also from being rich. We need to be freed from being white or being people of color, from being gay or being straight. We need to be free from being male and female. We need to be freed from being Jew or Gentile, from being circumcised or uncircumcised. All of these things are nothing They count for absolutely nothing. The only thing that matters is the new creation, which is decisively brought into being because of the crucifixion of Jesus. Okay, so here's the thing. Is Paul is boasting in this message that frees him from all the scripts of what his life is supposed to be. And this very same message of freedom for Paul is the freedom for you and me. You don't need to work harder, try better, have better intentions, get it all better under control. Whatever version of law you may have, whatever life script you may have that enslaves you and crushes you and curses you, Jesus died in order to free you from that, in order to hold that to open shame, in order to prove and demonstrate the fact that that would never bring you true blessing and the presence of God which you actually need. Jesus came to snatch you out of the grasp of that cruel task master. We celebrate, we boast in the cross because our entire worlds have been crucified to us.
we have been crucified to our entire worlds. We no longer circle and run on this rat race of humanity trying to control everything like everyone around us has, but we realize that God has invaded history on our behalf to take care of us. He's come to rescue us, to fill us with his spirit. Oh, what hope we have in this gospel of the cross. It obliterates all of our expectations. It obliterates all of our foundation. It obliterates our world, even as it obliterates the law. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to leave you with two questions. Number one, are you living a life that boasts in the good news of the cross, that the entire world cannot satisfy you, that the entire world will never take care of you, that the entire world will never bring you true blessing, that the entire world will never actually pay off the way that your soul and heart and relationships need it to pay off? That's question number one. Question number two, if you could be freed from any one thing by Jesus, what would it be? If you could be freed from that one thing that's dominating you, that's setting your life script, saying you must do this or you will be cursed. If, if you could be freed from that one thing, what would it be? And how does the cross of Jesus start to free you from that? And then how finding freedom from that, realizing that Jesus is your only redeemer, your only rescuer, your only one that can put that sort of thing to death in his own death. If, if you start to realize that and start to ask for freedom for that, how might that invite you to live a life of love and freedom and simplicity? God to preach this good news to your heart. This gospel of Jesus centered on his death and his resurrection has to do with him crucifying our entire worlds. In other words, it has to do us being snatched out of the grasp of this present evil age that dominates us and worries us and crushes us. If we are going to be people who live in light of resurrection, who believe in resurrection, to our old ways of life? Can't we exhale? Can't we set all of those things down? Can't we experience even here and now the spirit of this risen Christ who loves us me, who gave himself for us, who gave himself for me. Jesus, don't let us just understand. Let us be made new. Let us be made a new creation. We don't need circumcision of circumcision. We need a new creation. We need you and your rescue. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirits, my brother, my brothers and sisters.